All right, this is chapter two of R. Glenn Hubbard's and Anthony Patrick O'Brien's Economics, the seventh edition. We will talk about trade-offs, comparative advantage, and the market system. So we will start with the production possibility frontiers, which illustrates uh, opportunity costs. We will talk a bit about comparative advantage and trade in the market system. As we discussed in chapter one, economics is the study of the choices people make to attain their goals, given their scarce resources. So economics assumes we have a limited wants. However, um, we cannot get everything we want. Um, our wants are limited because resources are scarce. And so in order to gain more of, let's say good A, we have to give up some of good B. And this is what we call a trade-off. And so in our example, we will talk a little bit about Tesla. Tesla has a plant in Fremont. And in 2017, uh, they sold 50,000 Model S sedans and Model Xs, which is their sport utility vehicle. And both of these cars were priced quite high. And so they introduced um, a more affordable, what they call Model 3. However, they had limited resources. They had a certain number of workers, certain number of space in their factory. And so they had to make a decision, um, how many Model 3 should they produce versus the other models. So we will illustrate the trade-off uh, Tesla makes using what we call the production possibilities frontier. So this will be a curve. And given the current resources, it will show the different combinations of the two goods or the two different models that Tesla can make given the technology and their resources. And just a side note, the production possibility frontier is a positive tool. It shows what is, which is like a fact, not what should be, which is normative analysis, and that's an opinion. Okay, so we see here in the table, there's different choices, A, B, C, D, and E. And these choices have a different combination of the original models produced per day, and then the models, the quantity of Model 3s produced per day. So, for example, in choice A, Tesla decides to produce 80 models of the original per day and zero of the Model 3s. So, in this choice, they are devoting all their resources to producing the original models. And then at the other extreme in choice E, they are producing no original models and only producing model threes. In that case, if they devote all their resources to producing model threes, then they will also be able to produce 80 of them. And then B, C, and D are just different combinations. So they devote most of their resources to produce 60 original models, and that leaves them with enough leftover to produce 20 model threes, and then Choice C is split down evenly, and then choice D, they would produce um, some models, original models, but uh, mainly model threes. So the graph below is a production possibility frontier, and it is going to illustrate these different combination of choices. So on the vertical axis, we have quantity of original models produced per day. And on the horizontal axis, we have quantity of Model 3s produced per day. And so if we were to graph out our choices, we see choice A. Again, in choice A, Tesla devotes all of their resources to produce 80 original models a day. Okay. And then, so they're producing 80 original models a day and zero model three okay choice b they're producing 60 original models and 20 model threes choice c they're producing 40 original models and 40 model threes and choice d they're producing 20 original models and 60 model threes and 
choice E, where they have zero original models and all the resources are devoted to producing 80 model threes. Okay. So first concept I want to introduce you to is that any point on the production possibility frontier is what we call efficient. Efficiency means that all available resources are being used. Now, any point inside the production possibility frontier, so in this case, we see point F, and point F is 30 original models and 10 model threes. So this is attainable. They have enough resources to produce this combination. However, it is not efficient because they're not using all their available resources. So there are gonna be machines that aren't being used. There are gonna be workers that are not being used. And any point outside the production possibility frontier, so outside of the green line, in this case, it's G, is unattainable because to produce 60 original models, and 50 Model 3s, they would need additional resources, and they do not have that right now. Now, if Tesla were to expand their factory and get more workers, then yes, they would be able to produce at that point. But given their current situation, they are not able to produce at that point. The other concept that the production possibility frontier illustrates is that of opportunity cost. And opportunity cost is the highest value alternative that must be given up to engage in an activity. Or in other words, it's what you give up to get something else. So let's start with point A. Again, there's 80 original models being produced and zero Model 3s. If when we move to point from point A, to point B, what we see is the trade-off is we gave up 20 original models in order to produce 20 Model 3. So we went from 80 to 60 original models and gained 20 Model 3s. So the opportunity cost of producing 20 Model 3s is 20 original models. And when we move from point B to point C, okay, so we go from producing 60 to 40 original models, and then we gain an, another additional 20 model threes. And then same from going from C to D, we give up another 20 original models to gain 20 more model threes. And then from D to E, the same concept. So in order to gain 20 Model 3s, we have to give up 20 original models. So the opportunity cost of producing one Model 3 is one original model. So for every Model 3 we produce, we give up one original model. And the reverse holds true too. For every original model we produce, we give up one Model 3. Now, in the last slide, we saw that the production possibility frontier was a perfectly straight line. And when it's a perfectly straight line, that means the opportunity cost is constant. It doesn't change. So we saw as we go from point A to point B, the opportunity cost of producing one Model 3 was giving up one Model S. So all along, doesn't matter, you go from point A to point B, B to C, C to D, D to E, the opportunity cost was the same. However, in reality, the production possibility frontier would be bowed out. And that is because as we move from producing one good to the other good, opportunity costs are usually increasing. So let's say in times of war, we used all of our resources to produce tanks. And let's say 
uh, the war is starting to wind down. And so we use some of those resources to produce automobiles. So going from point A to point B, we see that in order to increase automobile production by 200, we give up producing 50 tanks. But when we go from point B to point C, in order to produce another 200 automobiles, we give up producing 150 tanks. And to go from point C all the way to producing just automobiles, we would give up an additional 200 tanks in order to gain 100 automobiles. So as we can see here, as we move along from point A, and let's just label this point D, to point D, for every additional car that is being produced, we give up more and more tanks. And this illustrates that the resources used to produce tanks don't exactly translate the same way to produce automobiles. So if we're going from point A to point B, the resources that are best adapted to producing automobiles and maybe workers that are better at producing automobiles are the first employed in the machinery. But as we start producing more and more automobiles, um, then we pull away workers from producing tanks, for example, and they may not at, be as efficient at producing automobiles as they were tanks. So they're giving up producing a lot of tanks in order to put their skills to produce those automobiles. The production possibility frontier can also illustrate economic growth. So let's say we have... Um, for example, immigration, so we have more workers. Remember, labor is a resource. Or we have better technology where with the same amount of workers, um, the technology enables them to make more of each good. So a shift outward of the production possibility frontier illustrates economic growth. So before, with the original curve, they could produce either 400 tanks, or 500 automobiles or some point in between or some combination, excuse me, in between. And let's say with, you know, an increase in technology, it could be an increase in labor, et cetera. Now they are able to produce either 500 tanks, 625 automobiles or some type of combination of those two. But the second line illustrates a higher quantity of tanks and automobiles than the first. Now let's say the technological improvement only improved in the automobile industry. Then if the economy decides to only produce tanks, they will still remain at 400 tanks. But if they decide to produce automobiles with the new improved technology, they are able to produce more automobiles than before. So in very recent times, one of the goods that has become highly in demand is hand sanitizer. And with the coronavirus and how contagious it is, um, everyone wiped the shelves of hand sanitizer. And so there was a, seemed like a worldwide shortage. And so we had um, some distilleries devote their resources, especially since restaurants and bars were closed. And so, you know, the sales of alcohol plummeted. And so what they did, let's say they were producing beer before, hand sanitizer. Okay. And so they started devoting their resources from producing beer to producing more and more 
sanitizer, hand sanitizer. Now, what eventually ended up happening is companies like Purell were able to catch up um, with the demand, so they were able to produce more. So let's say the companies went from producing mainly hand sanitizer and just a little bit of beer back up to producing more beer, especially as restaurants and bars opened, and some hand sanitizer. So moving on to comparative advantage and trade. So let's say you and your neighbor have an apple and cherry tree in each of your yards. But again, time is a limited resource. And so you only have a certain amount of time to pick apples and or cherries. So if you were to devote all of your time to picking apples, then you could pick 20 pounds of apples. And obviously, all, since all your times used to pick apples, no cherries. And if you were to devote your time to only picking cherries, you would produce 20 pounds of cherries. Your neighbor, if they were to devote their time to only producing apples or to picking apples, they would produce 30 pounds of apples. And if they were to devote their time to only picking cherries, they would produce 60 pounds of cherries. Okay, if we were to draw your production possibility frontier, it would look like the one on the left, where if you devoted all your time to picking apples, you would pick 20 pounds of apples. If you were to devote your time to only picking cherries, you would pick 20 pounds of cherries. And then any line or any dot on the production possibility frontier would show a different combination of the two fruits. And then your neighbor's production possibility frontier, they could either devote all their time to apples and yield 30 pounds of apples, or all their time to cherries and yield 60 pounds of cherries, or some type of combination in the middle. So if you're and your neighbor decided to, you know what, why don't we specialize in picking the fruit that we're uh, better at and trade. Well, the thing is, is that your neighbor is actually better at picking apples and cherries than you are. So can you still benefit from specialization and trade? So let's see. So let's say before you met your neighbor, you decided that you would pick eight pounds of apples and 12 pounds of cherries of wheat for your consumption. And your neighbor would pick nine pounds of apples a week and 42 pounds of cherries for their consumption. And then you meet your neighbor and you guys decide to specialize in trade. And under this agreement, you're gonna specialize in picking apples because you, so you pick 20 pounds of apples and your neighbor specializes in picking cherries, so they pick 60 pounds of cherries, and then you guys trade. So you trade 10 pounds of your apples, and you gain 15 pounds of cherries from your neighbor. And so your consumption, and this is very, very important here, is point B. Now, a few slides ago, we said a point outside the production possibility frontier is not possible. And yes, you, if you were to only rely on your own skills and not trade, then yes, you would not be able to reach point B or to consume at point B. However, with specialization in trade, you're actually able to consume outside your production possibility frontier. Now let's see if your neighbor is better off. Okay, so with specialization in trade, your neighbor now will consume 10 pounds of apples and 45 pounds of cherries. And this is illustrated by point D. So they too are able to consume outside their production possibility frontier. So your neighbor also, even though your neighbor was better at picking apples and cherries than you, they were still able to 
gain from specializing and then trading with you, they were able to consume more than they would have been than they would have otherwise had they just decided to not trade. So this is illustrated in the table. Okay, so you, without trade, you would produce and consume eight pounds of apples, 12 pounds of cherries. Your neighbor would produce and consume nine pounds of apples, 42 pounds of cherry. So when you decided to specialize, you specialized in only apples, your neighbor in only cherries. So you produce 20 pounds of apples, your neighbor 60 pounds of cherries. And then once you trade, okay, you were able to consume 10 pounds of apples, which is an increase of two pounds compared to if you did not specialize in trade. And you were able to consume 15 pounds of cherry, which is three more pounds than if you decided not to specialize in trade. And then your neighbor is also better off through specialization in trade. So they were able to consume one more pound of apples than if they, than it had they not decided to trade and three more pounds of cherries. So where did these gains from trade come from? So let's talk a little bit about absolute advantage and comparative advantage. So your neighbor had the absolute advantage in both apples and in cherries. They were better at picking both than you were. So absolute advantage is the ability of an individual firm or a country to produce more of a good or service than competitors using the same amount of resources. So you both, your resource was time. You both had the same amount of time, but your neighbor was more efficient at producing or at picking these two fruits. Now comparative advantage is the ability of an individual, a firm, or a country to produce a good or service at a lower opportunity cost than their competitors. And so when we look at comparative advantage, we have to look up who gives up less cherries to pick apples and who gives up less apples to pick cherries. So for every pound of apple, that you picked, you gave up picking one pound of cherry. Your neighbor, for every pound of apple they picked, they gave up picking two pounds of cherries. All right, and calculating this, okay, is with your limited time of resource, you could pick all cherries, which would be 20 pounds or all apples, which would be 20 pounds. And so for every pound of cherries you pick, you're giving up one pound of apple and vice versa. For every pound of apple you pick, you're giving up one cherry, one pound of cherries. So your neighbor, okay, if they were to only pick cherries, they would pick 60 pounds. And if they were to only pick apples, they would pick 30 pounds. Okay, so for every pound of apples they pick, they're giving up picking two pounds of cherries. That's their opportunity cost. And for every pound of cherries they pick, they're giving up one half pound of apples. So you have the comparative advantage in picking apples because your opportunity cost of picking one pound of apples is one pound of cherries, whereas your neighbor's opportunity cost of picking one pound of apples is two pounds of cherries. So you're giving up less cherries to pick one pound of apples than your neighbor. And your neighbor has the comparative advantage in picking cherries. Uh, they're only giving up a half a pound of apples for every pound of cherries that they pick, whereas you're giving up one pound of apples for every pound of cherries that you pick. 
So a country or a person does not need to have the absolute advantage to benefit from specialization and trade. They only need to have the comparative advantage. And so gains from trade come from comparative advantage, not absolute advantage. So we saw um, a couple slides back that through specialization and trade, you and your neighbor were able to consume at points outside the production possibility frontier. So despite the fact that your neighbor had the absolute advantage in picking cherries and picking apples, the gains from trade came from the comparative advantages that each of you have, not from the absolute advantage. And so if we were to apply this again in our daily life, there is actually a book called Spousonomics, and it uses economics uh, to make marriage a little easier. And one of the examples um, is dividing chores within a household. Instead of dividing everything 50-50, so like one night you wash the dishes, the next night your partner washes the dishes, etc. It's specialize what you're better at. So if you're much faster at washing dishes and they're much quicker at doing and folding laundry, then that's what you should specialize in. And the result will be you'll be able to finish these chores faster and you'll be able to have more free time. A market is a group of buyers and sellers of a particular good or service and the institution by which they come together to trade. And this trade is facilitated through the use of currency. So two key groups, households, these are the individuals who provide the factors of production, which is labor, capital, natural resources, and entrepreneurial ability and other inputs that make the goods and services. And households receive payments for these factors by selling them what we call in factor markets. And then firms use these factors of production. They produce the goods and services and supply them to product markets. And then households buy these products from the firm. So the four factors of production are labor, capital, natural resources, and entrepreneurial ability. So labor is any type of work and households supply labor. Capital is, in this sense, it's physical capital. Sometimes you'll see capital and finance uh, referred to as like money or stocks, etc. In this case, it's physical capital, such as computers, office buildings, any type of um, machinery and tools that you know, all come together used to produce a good or supply a service. And then natural resources would be land, water, oil, iron, or other um, raw materials. And the last is entrepreneurial ability. So we need the idea of an entrepreneur. They come up with the idea to produce a certain good or supply a certain service, and they bring together the other factors of production, the labor, the capital, and the natural resources needed to produce and supply goods and services. All right, the circular flow diagram is a model and it shows how participants in the market are linked. So for example, we have households and households provide the factors of production. So they provide their labor, they provide their capital. Um, for example, an office building is owned by someone in a household. Uh, they provide resources. And firms provide goods and services that they sell to households. And then firms pay money to households for the factors of production that they supply. So for example, uh, they pay households money for their labor. They pay households money for rent. And then households, when they buy a good or service, they pay money to these firms. Since the circular flow is a simplified version of reality, it does have its limitations. It doesn't illustrate, for example, um, the government because you know households do pay money to the government in form of taxes. And then the government also provides goods and services to households. So for example, um, like public education 
is one service that government will provide to a household. It doesn't show the financial system. It doesn't show the f- foreign buyers and sellers of goods. And we will talk about this in more detail in subsequent chapters. So a free market is a market where there are very few government restrictions on how a good or service can be produced or sold or how a factor of production can be employed. So the United States, yes, we do have some government restrictions on certain goods and services, uh, but for the most part, we are a free market. And what we have seen over time is that countries that follow more of a free market model have been more successful than countries that have centrally planned economies. And therefore, free market economies tend to also have a higher standard of living. Adam Smith in his book, The Wealth of Nations, argued for free markets. Um, He said it is much more efficient to produce and sell a good based on what the consumer demands than it is for the government to decide um, how much of that good to produce. So, you know, the government can say, oh, well, you need to produce 500,000 pairs of shoes, but let's say the consumers only demand 200,000 pairs of shoes. And so that leads to a waste of resources because you have 300,000 pairs of shoes in surplus, for example. And so Adam Smith argued that let the consumer and the producer talk to each other and through their interactions, the producer will know how much to produce uh, based on the demand of the consumer and it leads to a better and more efficient outcome. The beauty of the free market is that um, there doesn't need to be a central planning authority. The government doesn't need to be involved in these micro decisions. Um, Individuals, we are only acting in our own rational self interest. And so through the interaction with producers, uh, the price is determined, the quantity to be produced is determined, and uh, it leads to a more efficient outcome. And producers are happy and consumers are happy as well because they're able to get what they want. So one entrepreneur that comes to mind is Steve Jobs. And he was able to make a slew of products that many of us use today. And we almost feel like we can't function without them and with our Apple Music at one point, um, the iPods, now our phones act as an iPod, our phones act as a mini computer with the iPads, et cetera. He gave us products that we, a lot of us enjoy and consume. And he was the one with this idea who brought together all the factors of production to make it happen. So entrepreneurs uh, are imperative for an economy to keep growing, for invention to happen and innovation also to keep happening. And many times the products that entrepreneurs make can help um, increase economic growth and standards of living. Uh, For example, William, Carrier invented the air conditioner, and that has made it easier for us to work and be more efficient in our work. Trying to do work without AC, especially in Texas, would be very hard. We would get very tired. There would be some days that that it would be so hot we wouldn't be able to work and we would lose productivity. Um, The Wright brothers, you know, invented airplanes. And so you could see on and on with this list these inventions that have changed our lives, have increased economic growth and also increased our productivity. One key component um, in order for entrepreneurship to be encouraged is that we must have legal enforcement of property rights. Uh, Some countries don't grow because there's too much of a risk for entrepreneurs there. If you buy a plot of land and it can be taken away from you 
by the government, especially without payment. If there's crime rampant and your business keeps getting looted, for example, or your home keeps broken, keeps getting broken into and everything you have keeps getting stolen. Um, there's little incentive to be an entrepreneur. So property rights are key. Entrepreneurs need a safe and sound environment in order to build their business, in order to produce their goods and provide their services. And thankfully, in a country like the United States, property rights are enforced and we have a strong legal system to help enforce the fairness. And so we don't have much problem with this as we see in other countries. All right, this concludes chapter two.